Right. So I'll start just a little bit about ourselves as an introduction to who we are and what we do. And then I shall go into uh, the packages that have been put in place by the UK government to try and help companies and individuals get through this, uh, this COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, so starting with ourselves, uh, we're a council firm. We've been going for 11 years now. It's actually our 11th birthday last week. Uh, we've got offices in Manchester, Leeds and London. And we would have had an office in Liverpool last month, but obviously that's on hold now. We had an acquisition line of that's on hold now until until Corona's died down a bit. So that's hopefully for, for later in the year. Uh, and we try and do everything, everything under one, one roof for our clients, really. So I look after the audit and, and compliance team. So that's the normal year-end accounts and audit side of things. But we do have our own internal funding team who can get uh, go to a whole, whole host of lenders and get different forms of, of debt financing for those. We have a, a corporate finance team who look after mergers, acquisitions, uh, management buyouts, uh, sales of companies. We have our own wealth management team who look after pensions, advice, insurances for our, for our clients. Our own specialist tax team, payroll, management accounts. We have like an outsourced FD role. Uh, so we do try and do everything to our clients uh, under one roof to help them along their journey, really. Uh, another department we have is, is the R&D team, which is research and development. I'll come to that uh, towards the end of my presentation regarding uh, support that's out there for businesses. Uh, so that's a brief, brief bit about Sajulo. Uh, in terms of industries, we do do a fair bit in sports. So we act with a few professional football clubs, rugby league clubs. Uh, we act with some national governing bodies here in the UK, uh, sports individuals themselves. But we're not really industry specific. We do act, act in a whole host of, of different industries. Uh, yes, that's a bit about us. So on to the, I suppose, the, the package that was announced by the government back in end of March now. And he kind of announced it as a big 330 billion umbrella access to cash is what the Chancellor called it. And there's two elements to that, I suppose. One is, is grants, so free cash to companies. And one is other assistance that they've given to, to companies and individuals. So I'll talk about the grants first and then come on to the, the other packages later on. And there's three, I suppose, three main grants for companies that are out there. Uh, two fall under the business rate scheme. So if you're in the retail, hospitality or leisure industry, uh, you're entitled to a grant of up to £25,000 per property. And that per property is quite key because if you're a chain of travel agents, you might own five or six shops in various uh, towns or cities, you could be entitled to about £25,000 per, per location. If you're a smaller company in that industry, you're entitled to a £10,000 grant. So it depended on, on, your, on your rateable value of your premises that you, uh, that you occupy. Now, if you're not in those sectors, the government also will own a £10,000 grant for companies who pay or are entitled to small business rates relief, and that was for all industries. So if you were in, in those main industries, you, you, could, you couldn't get £25,000, but you, still, you could still get the £10,000 grant. Uh, aimed, at more, aimed at more small businesses that, that than, than larger ones. Also for the uh, retail, hospitality and leisure sectors, there's also no business rates to pay for the entire 2020, 2021 year neither. So you have no rates to pay for the next year neither. And that was all done early April, really. So the government announced that back in the March. It was rolled out early April and it's gone quite well, I think. Uh, the funds were released to the local authorities. They handed them out fairly quickly. It was kind of done automatically. We had a lot of people's details through the direct debit system who were paying previously. And cash got out, got out pretty quickly, really. Uh, if you weren't contacted, there was still an online portal where you could go onto each local authority's website and make your own application. And that has worked, like I say, worked, worked pretty well. Uh, as of the 27th of April, uh, 7.5 billion had been handed out under that scheme, but that was only 61% of what the government had, had earmarked for that. So there's still a, a fair bit out there that they were trying to push out. And I do know in some councils, because they've been contacting some of our clients who haven't yet claimed the grant, but were, were eligible to it. And the councils are actively chasing people up to try and get those claims in. So that has been sort of well rolled out and I think well received uh, and has gone, has, has, gone, has gone pretty smoothly, really. A few companies fell under the, un, fell between the cracks in, the, in that package, I suppose. Uh, and the Chancellor has announced other measures this week to try and combat some of those. So if you're a bed and breakfast uh, type company, for example, you'll probably pay council tax in your, in your house and won't pay business rates. They've brought a scheme out this week to try and contact, uh, try and grab those people. Also, people in shared office spaces. Again, you might not pay rates directly, but it's kind of packed into a service charge. And we are encouraging people to try and get in touch with their landlords, try and get their rates reference number there they're using, and try and claim that way. So although you might be in a shared centre and not directly paying rates, there still can be a chance where you can actually have to claim, claim that grant. 
So it's worth if you're in a situation contacting your, your landlord. Uh, so that's, that's, the, that's the first one that was announced. Uh, following on from that was, I suppose, the massive, the massive headline scheme really, which was the job retention scheme. And that is basically encouraging employers to keep people employed by paying 80% of their salary, up to a cap of £2,500. Uh, and I thought a new, a new term came into the dictionary called furloughed, where people are put on furlough, they can't work, so they can't do any type of, of work in, in that. They were supposed to place them on that furlough, and it's for a minimum of three-week period at a time. Uh, I think, again, the government announced it was going to... Uh, Going to be going to release on 20th of April, and due to the word, the online system went live 20th of April, uh, and funds were received within six working days of that. So, I think conscious of that they, they didn't want to overpromise, and they kind of they gave us some targets, and they have stuck to them to be fair. So, it, I think people were planning, certainly companies were trying to plan to make sure their cash flows were were, were tight, and and they making sure that if money was promised, it, it, would, it would land when agreed. And the government have stuck to that to be fair. Uh, a massive cost though, I think we've processed £1.4 million worth of grants for our clients as of last Friday. Overall for the country, uh, I think 800,000 companies had applied for it in April, a cost of 6.3, sorry, 6.3 million jobs and a cost of £8 billion uh, of grants given out so far, that's just April. Have you seen some estimates saying it could be as high as £40 million pounds coming into the scheme uh, when it's when it's all done? So a massive, massive uh, cash, cash influx there for, for the government. But like I say, it has worked well. A few teaming problems on day one, but overall, the online system's held up pretty, pretty well. Funds have been given out uh, as promised. So overall, I think that scheme has worked pretty well. Uh, one thing I would say on that, obviously, because employers haven't been allowed to work, I think there's a whole mental health aspect around people stuck at home all day, not being able to work, and not being able to do anything for the company whatsoever. And that could affect companies trying to bounce back when, when lockdown is released, because you can't do anything in terms of attracting new clients or any kind of marketing, that kind of stuff. So I think one thing the government probably has missed there, but I do get it's kind of hard to come up with a package that, uh, that, that, that can be policed, really. So I think you have to try and, try and find, find a balance tonight between the two. Uh, so that covered the employed people and companies. Then the self-employed kind of uh, kicked to the foot and said, well, what about us? And the government then, then jumped onto that. Similar kind of package for a self-employed. So again, 80% of their... Uh, well, it's based on profits for self-employed people. So the average profits for the past three years, uh, and they got 20, they get 80% of that, of that figure paid over three months. Now, with the uh, employed one, you, you can't work. Self-employed could carry on working. All they've got to prove is that they've been somehow affected by corona. So they could, in theory, lose one small job, carry on working as normal and still claim the full grant. The other difference here is if your profits were over £50,000, you got nothing. So if your profits were 49999 for example, you would get a full £7,500 grant. If you earn an average of £2 more for the past three years, you get nothing. I think Chas were trying to target people who, who were desperate for the cash or more needed it. But again, maybe that's not quite as fair as the employment one. But the fact that people can carry on working in, in a self-employed, I think was a big boost to them. And I think maybe a, a bit a bit too... Uh, Bit too generous potentially but it has hinted that in in the future uh, tax taxes will will rise for those kind of people so they will be paying it back in in the long term i think so i think watch up watch your space on that one uh, one thing to note on that i suppose is directors and shareholders and, and owner managed businesses they have been largely cut out of, of that so directors would normally file a tax return each year which would show a, a low salary and dividends that's all normally they'd be paid so in that scenario, they treat as self-employed. In this scenario, they weren't treated as self-employed. So they were kind of cut out of that. So yes, they could fail themselves, but they'll be entitled to 80% of their basic salary, which might be 10,000 pounds a year. So I'll probably say two, two and a half thousand pounds would be what they're entitled to. So not a lot on offer really for directors. And if you're, uh, say a consultant, maybe don't have a fixed office, so I couldn't claim a rates relief, you can't get that. You can't really get much for your wage. They have been kind of, kind of cut out really. So. As he's gone along with Chancellor, he has tried to fix stuff like that. And I know there has been lobbying regarding that, where those were supposed to be people, but as of yet, nothing's been announced uh, regarding that. So a bit, a, bit, a bit harsh on those. I think he's probably taken a view that it is a tax efficient way to get paid. Therefore, you had your benefit in the past. Therefore, you're not getting your benefit now. But I think a lot of people have been affected by that who aren't rich directors, you know, are basically self employed, but just, are just paid to be a limited company. And they have been largely are affected by this. It, it is a, it can't cover everyone, and that's the kind of the people he has, he has to miss out, really. 
Just a brief mention on charities there as well. Um, there's been some funds released, about £750 to charities to help them carry on their, their good work in, in the communities. So there are basically the cash, the cash uh, grants I've been giving out there. Other options, so he's tried to get some, uh, some lenders, give some cash out to people. Uh, he's done that via the COVID business interruption loan scheme, or CBLS for short. This has been pretty, fairly widely criticised uh, because it's, it's via your lenders and your banks. They still want full business plans, projections, cash flows, historical information. And it goes through the bank's normal lending process, which isn't quick. Factoring they're all working from home, it's even slower. We've been a fair bit of experience with our clients of submitting applications, takes them a week to come back, come back and come back more questions back and forward. So it has been quite a slow process. So a fun time getting out get out there that, that quickly at all for, for this one. We asked I've done I think about 8.3 million of one applications for our clients. I don't think many have been paid out so far, so it, it is pretty slow. As I did mention before, we do have our own funding team, so we've been looking at alternative uh, finance for, for people. That's been a bit quicker. I think we've done about 17 million pounds of applications for our clients, for alternative funds. Uh, but yeah, so BC loans haven't, haven't been in practice that great. I suppose to listen to, that, to, to, to those complaints, the Chancellor announced last week the bounce back loan scheme, which has been uh, fairly successful, I'd say. That was announced last week, went live on Monday, and that's just more small companies. But if you're, well, you can get a loan up to 25% of turnover. Uh, to a maximum of fifty thousand pounds, and that's interest free in year one, then only two point five percent interest payable in future years. So fairly cheap, cheap lending. Uh, the government will cover, let's say, all 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 fees and loan and interest in year one. Uh, there's no guarantees required for directors, and that has flown through. So banks have seen that as, as, as a low risk way of getting funding out there because the government are backing it. So on the first day, I think seventy thousand loans were approved on Monday in day one. So a value of 2.1 billion pounds of debt going out there. So that has, I suppose, remedied some of the quick single C bills. It's not for everyone. Um, and I think not just suitable for large companies, but certainly for, for, for small businesses, Super Chancellors keep saying they're the backbone of the, of the country. It has, it has got some funds out there. Uh, whether some of that just replace the lack of support for directors, I don't know in this situation, but at least it is, it is getting cash out there, out there for people. And finally, there's a bit of a lot of schemes out there. Uh, so time to pay. HMRC have allowed companies to get payment plans on page worm debt. So a fair few of our clients have just not paid any page worm between April and June and pushing that on to later in the year. HMRC have been fairly okay with that. Uh, personal tax payments due in July are pushed back to next January. Uh, your next VAT quarter is not payable now, so any VAT quarters due between April and June are now payable March next year. So a lot of taxes have been, have been pushed down the line, but, but it's just that they are pushed down the line and not, not written off. So come January, February, March time, we'll find a lot of people having to pay a full year's worth of personal tax bills, plus two VAT returns in the space of a couple of months, and that could be when the cash flow starts getting, starts getting time. So I think business owners need to be careful and plan, and plan ahead for that next year to make sure there, are, there is enough cash. I think, I think the government is kind of hoping for a big bounce in the second half of the year, once lockdown's eased, that can get some cash back into the economy uh, so people can start building up, building up their cash reserves again to, to, to fund this. I mean, HMRC, like I say, have been updating stuff all the time, so maybe it gets, it gets later in the year and they might actually say, do you know what, we'll allow people fit for the time to pay. Uh, so that's that. Mortgage holidays, so again, trying to cut, pe uh, cut people's burn rates month by month. People are allowed to get a female payment holiday on, the, on their mortgage payments, which just has helped some people just, just like I said, cut, cut, that, cut that monthly, monthly burn rate of cash. And R&D, I've touched on it before, it's, it's free cash for people. It's a great tax scheme over here in the UK. Any companies that are doing any kind of activities... <laughs> Bless you. <laughs> uh, can can lower their lower their tax bills, they can get tax refunds. So it's a, it's a great scheme here in the UK. I think about one in ten companies are taken up on it who are eligible. So it's it's kind of un underused. Uh, it doesn't have to be people in, in white coats and in a lab. It can be all sorts of uh, different different industries. We've done it for sports clubs, uh, manufacturing companies, anything that systems that kind of stuff. Uh, yeah, and it's it's, it's, it's it's free cash for companies. And we've done HMRC turning it around quite quickly because I know it, it is cash to get it out there to people. So we have done forty million pounds of, of claims in the in the past past six weeks, as resulted in two point four million pounds of the cash back to, to clients. So so decent figures there. Uh, but something if you are business owners and you are you do some you're not claiming it currently, here's where having a chat with your accountant or specialist advisor and seeing is that something you, you could you could look at claiming. I think that's it. That's a that's kind of a 15-minute whistle-top tour of what's going on in the UK. Uh, 
it was all done on day one. It has been updated throughout the last couple of weeks. They have been trying to listen to people's worries and concerns and try and update where they can. Overall, I'd say relatively successful so far. Uh, certainly because our client base, no one's really been struggling for cash as of yet. I think as lockdown continues, that may change, but we'll hopefully get a clear picture on Sunday with, with the latest announcement. So I'm going to pass over to Sean. He can talk about the, the, the Canadian side. Thank you, Dan. If I could ask you to um, stop sharing your screen and then we'll hand over to Sean Murphy in Toronto, who will give us the update on the Canadian federal measures put in place. Great. Thanks, guys. Um, let me just get my screen up here. You see that? <clears throat> okay. Um, so thanks, by the way, uh, to both the Wolfpack and the folks at uh, Cedulo uh, for for letting me participate. Um, wanted to talk briefly about the uh, the different initiatives uh, that that the Canadian government has put forth uh, as a result of the pandemic. Um, just a little bit of quick background on myself. So uh, I've been with Deloitte for 15 years. Uh, for those of you that that don't know uh, about Deloitte, we're a uh, a large professional services firm. Uh, we provide a full range of, uh, of services to companies of all sizes, uh, audit, tax, consulting, et cetera. Uh, personally, I work in the tax group. Um, so I, I specialize in helping individuals with cross-border tax issues. Uh, so I do serve um, a, lot of, uh, a lot of athletes, um, a lot of uh, business executives that have uh, a cross-border tax filing requirement. Um, so hopefully I can give you a little bit of uh, general information, but the legislation, uh, probably similar to the, to the UK side, the legislation in Canada that was put forward, it was, it was put together relatively quickly um, for obvious reasons. And so there are a lot of uh, unanswered questions, I would say, in terms of how the legislation uh, will be interpreted. Um, so we are we are working with a lot of companies right now in terms of looking at their individual facts and circumstances to see how they might fit or qualify uh, for the different uh, programs. Let me just figure out. Okay, there we go. So the first um, uh, initiative that I'll, I just wanted to touch on is is called the CERB or the Canada Emergency Response Benefit. The CERB applies to uh, individuals. So. Uh, an el eligible individual is someone who has been residing in Canada um, at least 15 years of age and have had, has had an income of, of at least $5,000 in 2019 or in a rolling 12-month period uh, preceding the day on which they apply. Um, the CERB is very similar to our employment insurance or EI program in Canada. Um, and it allows an individual who has been um, laid off or, or you know, has, has been temporary let go, um, they're entitled to a, a fixed amount of $2,000 up to a maximum of $8,000 uh, in total. Um, a little bit more information on the CERB. Um, there was a recent development a few weeks ago where the government said, even if uh, an applicant has been allowed back to work, uh, they can still earn up to $1,000 per month from employment and still qualify for the $2,000 a month uh, CERB payment. Um, so they have uh, recognized that, you know, there, it is quite a hardship for those, of, for those individuals that have been put out of work and they want to try and really minimize the, the financial impact uh, for those individuals. Um, unfortunately, the the CERB payments will be considered taxable income. Um, so when um, an individual files their 2020 Canadian income tax return, um, they will actually have to pay pay tax on that. And unlike regular employment income, um, there's no tax that's being deducted at source. Uh, so that could create a, a payable situation when an individual files their their 2020 tax return. The main, I, I guess, initiative that I wanted to spend most of my time on um, is the is the SUS or the Canada Emergency Wage Subsidy. Uh, so this is a this is a significant program. Um, the the government has budgeted that um, it's going to cost uh, somewhere around seventy three billion dollars uh, that they've 
set aside to help businesses. Um, and the main purpose of the program is to really try and prevent further job losses um, and encourage employers to rehire individuals that have been uh, previously laid off as a result, as a result of COVID. Um, the SUS provides a 75% wage subsidy up to 12 weeks. Uh, and I'll go through some of the details in terms of the numbers on my next slide. Um, the main criteria at the employer or the entity level um, is that the employer must have realized a drop in revenue of at least 15% for the month of March and at least 30% for the months of April and May. Um, in terms of the, the comparative, so basically, uh, employers have the ability to choose whether they're comparing the same month in 2019 or they can use the average revenue for January and February of 2020. So for example, if, if, uh, if a Canadian company is um, looking at whether their revenue dropped by 15%, uh, they Uh, again, to stimulate the economy, economy and get uh, people back to work as quickly as possible. So in terms of the numbers, um, there, uh, there is no maximum in terms of how much um, a qualifying company can qualify for. Um, so a, a kind of a neat numerical example here, um, you can you can recover up to eight hundred and forty seven dollars per week per eligible employee. So for a company that has a hundred employees, for example, that that qualify, uh, each of those employees, if they were making more than eight hundred and forty seven dollars per week, um, this could mean over the whole twelve week period that this company would receive over a million dollars in funding um, through the through the SUS. Um, so it is a significant um, uh, initiative for sure. Um, there are a lot of, as I said before, a lot of technicalities in terms of um, the the criteria and and the eligibility, and and we we are working with many companies in terms of helping them understand um, whether or not they qualify. Um, another point worth noting is that in the in the legislation itself, um, it actually specifies that the government will have the right to publicly disclose um, the, the names of the companies that have applied through the program. Um, so that's actually, we've noticed that that, that has discouraged um, some companies from, um, from applying, um, particularly those companies that are publicly traded and have other disclosure requirements. They just don't want their name out there and associated with this. Um, we've noticed, um, because the SUS is relatively new, the SUS, the applications, uh, period opened a few weeks ago. Um, the CERB on the other hand, which is the individual program I talked about initially, um, that's been, um, like people have been receiving payments from that already. And like, that's been in effect since mid-March. Um, what we noticed for the CERB and we kind of expect the same to apply for the SUS is that um, there is very little upfront review, I would say, um, by the government because they really wanted to ensure that people are have, getting cash in their hands and the ability to kind of continue uh, continue on. Um, but uh, the big the big asterisk or the big but there is that um, we expect that there will be a lot of future audit activity as things. Uh, you know, as resources within the government free up. Um, so they have kind of threatened um, some pretty serious penalties uh, for any fraudulent claims. Um, and, and that also has, uh, um, 
I would say discouraged some companies that are kind of uncomfortable about whether they, they might qualify um, from, from applying to the program. Um, so my last point there, the initial penalty that they've uh, proposed was um, a, a repayment of the subsidy and then a 225% penalty on top of that and then even imprisonment for, for fraudulent claims. I think they've since uh, softened that a bit. I think the penalty is now um, 50% of the delta, meaning if you if you made a claim for $100,000, but you were only actually entitled to $50,000, you'd be paying a penalty of 50% of that delta, so 25,000 in that case. Um, I, I don't want to spend too much time on this. The main takeaway here is that you can't have um, employees who get both the CERB and the SUS. So for, for example, if, um, if you had an employee who was getting the CERB, so they had applied individually and they're receiving the, the $2,000 a month CERB uh, payment, the company cannot apply for the SUS. However, if they do choose to, to rehire the employee and retroactively pay them, um, they, can, they can qualify for the SUS, but then the employee actually has to repay the CERB that they received. So there's a lot of interaction um, between the two payments and um, you know, we're just encouraging employers to make sure that, that they're coordinated uh, with their employees to ensure that things are being done consistently and, and correctly. Um, my last slide here, um, just laying out some of the other measures that the government has, uh, has put forth. So um, being, being a tax accountant myself, I um, uh, usually April 30th is, is our filing deadline in Canada. And uh, it was a very strange April 30th for me uh, last week. I, I'm used to being able to shut down and, and you know, reintroduce myself to my family and uh, uh, get my life back and whatnot, but uh, they've actually pushed the deadline to June 1st. Uh, so I have another month or so of, uh, <laughs> of, of busy season, so to speak. Um, and uh, similarly at the corporate level, they've pushed back corporate tax filing deadlines. They've pushed back payment deadlines uh, till after August 31st, 2020. Um, there's what I've talked about um, today is is all the federal measures. There's also a number of uh, different provincial measures that uh, each province has undertaken. Um, I'd say the the most significant um, and, and recent development has been the small business rental assistance program, um, where the government, both governments, both provincial and federal, are collaborating and providing. Um, forgivable loans to um, commercial property owners who are agreeing to reduce their uh, rental payments um, by at least 75%. Um, so that's, I think we're going to see a lot of activity and, and people applying uh, for that. Um, and then similar to the UK, um, there has just been an increase in terms of the available credit. Um, both at the provincial level and the federal level uh, that has become available uh, to, to different businesses. Um, yeah, so that's all I had. And then I have my, of course, my legal disclaimer slide. <laughs> any Brilliant. questions or anything? Thank you very much, Sean. Yeah, if anybody's got any questions, if you could write them in the chat function, um, then we'll get as many of them answered as possible. If I could just ask, um, Dan, first of all, at Sedulo. Um, Dan, having listened to Sean discussing the Canadian measures, um, what are your thoughts on that in, compare, in comparison to what the UK is offering? I think the main comparison, obviously, is our job retention scheme is, is similar to their scheme. I think the percentage is slightly different. So we had, we had 80, they're 75, but they're thereabouts. Uh, I think the penalty is quite an interesting one because HMC haven't said yet about penalties in the UK. Uh, the normal maximum is about, is about 100% of penalties for, for fraudulent tax claims. So I'll be interested to see what, what, what we decide on that. And we do know they're going to start putting a lot of a, their, their, their compliance team into checking these claims at a later date. As, as Sean touched upon before, you, you can't check these claims before they're submitted. There's just too many of them. So down the line, they will still pick a, a, a big sample and, and put a lot of resources into checking these claims. Uh, 
we're here initially on a whistleblowing basis. So I think people who have been furloughed, staff members who may be a bit not happy about it and maybe smelling a bit of a rat, well, we can have like a helpline where they can whistleblow to, which will probably target HMRC's resources initially. Then I'll throw it out wider, wider to other companies. I think the people who are trying to claim it from the 1st of March will be probably the first to target because they want to announce till 20th, 20th of March. So I think we had a few clients trying to say, oh, we've, can we fill up from the 1st of March? Well, no, because we're still working up until the 20th because we won't announce until then. So I think 1st of March claims will probably be checked as well. Uh, and I think it'll be a massive PR nightmare for the companies uh, if they are found out to be, to be claiming these feelings correctly. I think that's the whole thing. That'd be a, yeah, a, a disaster to, to the companies really on that. Uh, Interesting regarding these two different policies. I know, just Sean, on, on the, the more individual one, so if you're, I suppose if you're laid off, you go into that scheme. If you're not laid off, you stay on the, on the, the company one, I'm guessing. Yeah, so the, like the CERB is intended for, uh, for people that have been laid off uh, or temporarily laid off. And then if they're, they're rehired and they're paid, then they can qualify, the employer can go back and qualify for the SUS, which is the employer wage subsidy. Okay. Interested on, on where the, the Canadian government are going to make it public, the companies who have claimed, and that, that's an interesting one. I know we had a uh, Liverpool FC in the UK who, who announced they were going to fail over staff and then quickly uh, did, did, did an about turn and changed their mind a few days later <laughs> with the PR. So, uh, <laughs> I, mean, I mean, they were planning to pay the staff of 100%, but obviously, I think people thought, well, I think they, they can get by without making a claim. So, yes, why should they make it? So, uh, I suppose in the UK, people have been outed, but, 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 not, but not officially, I suppose. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I, I, you know, when I first heard about that, um, it's interesting because in a way, it's, it's not really so much if they do disclose the names, it's not really so much shaming the company because in order for the company to qualify, it means that they're continuing to pay their employees. Um, so in a way, it's, it, it could make the company look good in the sense that they've continued to retain and, and pay their employees. So there's different schools of thought on that. And I think it, it depends on the, the facts and circumstances. Like, as I said before, if you're a, if you're a publicly traded company um, and you have all kinds of different financial disclosures and things like that, where, you know, this type of thing would hit your annual report or your, you know, you know your disclosure filings, that's a whole another set of issues. Um, but for the average small business or, or mid-sized company, I don't think a disclosure is going to deter someone from applying and also i think you mentioned in canada regarding you have to show a, a drop in income there's a there's no such requirement in the, in, in the uk for that so and, and i've heard of some some companies who have furloughed some staff who are actually turning over more now than they were a month ago depending on what, what industry they're in so and they're actually doing doing yeah getting the best of both worlds really uh, yeah so yeah so there's, there's no such a real for that in the in the, in the uk Great. Thank you very much both. Um, Sean, can I ask you to reflect on the UK measures in the same way that Dan's reflected on the Canadian measures? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, definitely interesting. Like I've been um, learning about um, other countries too. I, I hadn't, I, until today, I hadn't, you know, had a lot of detail on the, on the UK side. So yeah, it was interesting, interesting to hear. Um, it sounds like, um, and maybe I didn't catch this from the presentation, but in terms of like the the upfront review, is there is there a lot of scrutiny right now, or do you expect that that audit audit activity will will come later, Dan? Definitely later, yeah, definitely later, yeah. I think it's just it's just far too soon to try and get get checks done done on upfront. The only checks that have been really is uh, companies to apply for a furlough of a JRS scheme uh, had to have a payroll in place before it was announced. Uh, and employees had to burn that scheme before it was announced, so that can be checked by HMRC on an application. Uh, but there's no way they can check now if, if someone has been furloughed or not, which is just, just impossible to check that. Like I said, there will be quite detailed checks down the line, and they will be, I suppose, targeting certain companies. If, like I say, if a date was, was from the first of March, or if mm -hmm. there's been any kind of whistleblowing or, or any hints of a wrongdoing. So they will put a lot of resources from like kind of their, their VAT compliance and page rate compliance. I think pull those resources for a while, put them into a, into a COVID-19 compliance department and just, yeah, and try and check as, as many as they can, I suppose, really. Right, right. Yeah, I guess it's also interesting just the difference in terms of the, the, the timing of the different government focuses. Like, so in Canada, as I said, it's, it's tax season right now. So normally CRA, which is Canada Revenue Agency, 
would spending a lot of t would be spending a lot of time and resources in terms of processing, um, in this case, 2019 tax returns. Um, but in the UK, you know, I understand the tax year is different, and so presumably HMRC, you know, they might have a little bit more in terms of resources than uh, than CRA would this time of year. So it's just interesting the the timing difference, I guess. Yeah, yeah, because that's good. Obviously, the main deadline here in the UK is January. Uh, so that's been all submitted. For self-employed, actually, we did allow an extra month after announcing the scheme for people who were late in submitting the, 19, the 1819 tax, tax return. Oh, yeah. And submit that. Uh, so, so we did kind of delay it for everyone else, really, because everyone else had to wait a month for everyone, for everyone to file their returns. But, yeah, we did, I suppose, if that's fair or not, I don't know. If you've if not, if not got it on time, should, should you get the benefit? But that's what the HMSC thought, thought they would do. Uh, on the self-employed side, it is kind of automatic as well. So they obviously have, have that data already, so you don't have to make a claim for that. Whereas on the job retention scheme, you have to work out yourself what the claim's gonna be. For the self-employed side of things, it's just, they have, you have your data, they know if you're eligible or not, and you, you go in there, log, log your interest, and that's it, the, 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 the money comes to you. So that kind of is self-policing, because it, they have the data already. The JRS one, I think, yes, I think there'll be a, a lot of checks down the line on that. Because uh, you just can't check if someone's on two grand a week or three grand a week or a month or whatever, really. It's, it's, it's hard to check. So, uh, yeah, it'd be interesting to see how many resources he puts to that uh, down the line. We, we have tax investigations at the moment with clients, like, like normal VAT inquiries, and they've just been, just been cancelled for now, uh, put on hold. So, whether they'll revisit those first or just, but I, th I, think, I think they'll prioritise this, this, this COVID 19. If it's going to cost them forty billion pounds, they, they kind of want to be check, want to be checking as as a many as a as a as a kind of thing on that. So, thank you both. I've had uh, a question through here. Um, how much confidence indicators have your clients given at recovery once the lockdown is relaxed and things are back to normal? Considering that this time governments are supporting more than they did during the two thousand and eight crash. Can I put that to Sean first? I, sorry, I didn't catch all of the question, Jack. Sorry. Yeah, I'll, I'll read the question out again. Uh, how much confidence indicators have your clients given at recovery once the lockdown is relaxed and things are back to normal? How much confidence? Yeah. Um, so it, it's interesting. I, I can circulate um, uh, a link that maybe you can share uh, with the group after the call, Jack. Um, Deloitte Canada has actually put together this, this economic uh, recovery dashboard where they're using like real-time data um, and, uh, and AI um, to predict, you know, when different industries within the Canadian economy are going to, to bounce back. I, I think the general consensus is that um, it, it's going to be in recession mode until like late, late, calendar this year and start to bounce back uh, in early 2021. But obviously there's differences between the different industry groups and this this dashboard tool that the, the firm has put together, it it's really cool. It breaks out the different industries and um, ha again, uses real-time data um, along with AI to, to kind of make that prediction. So I can share that with the group um, after the call. That'd be great, thank you. And, and Dan, the same question too. Yeah, so over in the UK, I know the Bank of England released today some pretty negative news regarding uh, the next few months. So they think the same are going to drop by 14% this year. What the kind of press have missed out the headlines was that next year will actually increase by 15%. So over the course of, of a year, you'll be way back to where you were now. It's just that's was a bit of sensationalization of the press. They kind of go for the negative numbers and say, right, that's it, big, big reduction, 14% without really focusing on the fact that that's next year, it will, it will bounce back. Uh, I was on actually, and a webinar the other day with an economist, and he was probably too positive the other way. He, he was really optimistic about things. He was saying, I like saying back in 2008, the cash weren't there, whereas now it is. The government had done quite a decent budget before that in terms of getting, getting cash out there. And for now, he, he used the analogy of like a, a hose pipe, where at the moment the water's coming in, and it's now stuck in that hose pipe through lockdown. Once that's released, it'll all come flying out the other side. I think the chief's probably somewhere in between. I think obviously, like 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 Sean said, it will be industry by industry, and we'll probably will know a bit more come some come some announcement regarding lockdown. So when people can start getting back to work a bit more. Uh, one thing he did say, to be fair, was I'm not sure if this is a good thing or not. But in the retail industries of the sector that have been massively affected, the jobs it's affected are kind of a low paid or the young of students that kind of stuff. Uh, so in terms of the overall effect on the economy, it might not be as as, as bad as people first think. Uh, if you think someone who has failed at the moment and getting 8% of their salary, 
they can't go out to a pub, they can't go out to watch a sports match, they can't spend the money on anything. So they're kind of getting the money building up. Hopefully, when when lockdown is released, you can start spending that money and getting getting back into the economy. So I, th- I think certain industries will be affected, but I don't think it'll be quite. It's certainly, but I don't think it'll be as bad as 2008. Uh, and I think coming down next year, or certainly back in the next year, I think things will will, will bounce back back to normal, pending any kind of second waves or, 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 or that kind of thing. Really, I suppose. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Dan. Uh, thank you, Sean. So yeah, thank you to um, Sadulo and Deloitte for contributing to today's webinar. I think we'll uh, wrap it up just about there. Big thank you as well to our other webinar partners. They are Get Living, Treated.com and Rabners, as well as Rugby Strength. Uh, we'll be announcing next week's webinar in the next 24 hours or so. Whenever I hope you will join us once again. But for now, uh, stay safe, look after yourselves and uh, we'll see you all next week. Cheers, Zach. Thank you. Thank you, Al. Thank you, guys. Take care.